to, but there's other crime out there that maybe the government should be paying attention to instead of this. Uh, Mr. Uh, Nadelman, girl, we'll leave this recorded program now and take you back to the Capitol for live coverage of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. President, earlier today I was on the floor speaking about the importance of a program called the Economic Development uh, Revitalization. And it's been in place since 1965. It's run out of its authority. And our committee, the Environment Public Works Committee, in a near unanimous vote, almost unanimous, decided it was really worth making some reforms to the program to make it even work better and to, to reauthorize it. And I'm going to turn the time over to my wonderful friend, Jim Minhoff. He and I, as everybody knows, are good friends, and we, we work really well together. There are issues in which we sharply disagree. I think they would fall onto the environmental side. But when it comes to public works, when it comes to building the infrastructure of our country, when it comes to jobs related to the private sector, we are very much joined at the hip and on this particular issue we are together because we look at this and we we say at a time when there need to be jobs over a two-year period beginning in 09 grantees estimate that the EDA funded projects created over 160,000 jobs and for every dollar was invested by the federal government seven dollars came from the private sector so we're very pleased with this, and um, it's my pleasure to, of course, uh, make sure that my ranking member has sufficient time, whatever he would like, to speak to this issue. Thank you. Before I speak, are you... Uh, thank you. Um, Madam Chairman, I, the EDA is something that's worked very well in our state of Oklahoma. Let me first of all say that uh, uh, the senator from California is right. There are many uh, issues in which we do not agree. In fact, we have fought tooth and nail for a long, long time against the cap and trade and a lot of these environmental issues, and we'll continue to do so. However, the thing that we agree most on is not necessarily the EDA program, but is the need for a reauthorization of transportation. Uh, we have a really serious problem that uh, in my state of Oklahoma, just uh, a, a short while ago, a young lady who was the mother of, uh, of two small children uh, was driving under a bridge and it crumbled and it fell and, and killed her. 
And you know, th there's things like that, the crises that are going on right now. Uh, we were very proud when we had a very uh, robust, we thought at the time, a uh, highway reauthorization bill, transportation reauthorization bill in uh, 2005. And while the amount sounded like quite a bit, it was really not just, just barely enough to maintain what we had. So there are some things government's supposed to be doing. I've always said that uh, I'm always ranked as one of the most conservative members, but I'm a big spender in some areas like national defense and like infrastructure. And so that's one of the needs that we have. Uh, I would like to make one comment about this uh, in putting together this bill and taking it out of committee, which it did come out of committee uh, unanimously. Uh, there had been a GAO report that talked about duplication. I put language in in order to, uh, to, to have them identify anything that would be dupli duplicative so that that would come out because that was a little bit of a surprise to a lot of us. I don't question the report. I think it was probably accurate. But we took care of that because we don't want to have any duplication of efforts. Now, in my state of Oklahoma, I think we probably, the chairman said the seven to one ratio. We've actually done better than that in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, in one area, it was a uh, two and a quarter million dollar uh, EDA grant in Elgin, Oklahoma, which is adjacent to Fort Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is the uh, it, it right adjacent to a live range, and it was one that re was intended to actually produce a 150,000 square foot manufacturing business employing uh, many, many people. Because this administration axed some of the military programs, it didn't turn out to be that uh, that that beneficial. But the ratio there was still well in excess of 10 to 1. So if you want to get the economy moving, this is a way of doing it. But we have to do it in a way that, uh, that, we, uh, that is well thought out. I'm hoping that this uh, bill would be this way. It's my understanding that it's going to be open to amendments. And there are going to be a lot of amendments. And a lot of my friends who are not supportive of this uh, want to have this vehicle for that purpose. I certainly respect that. And we we'll look forward to uh, uh, working on this bill. I yield the floor. President? Senator from California. Mr. President, I want to thank my ranking member. I know he has a series of meetings, and uh, he's, he's off to that. But I just want to, again, thank him. I know uh, he may look at uh, reducing this uh, authority, and, and that's his right to do so. Uh, my own opinion is if there was ever a time to uh, support uh, programs that leverage dollars the way this one does, this is one of them. But I respect whatever he feels he needs to do to feel better <laughs> about the bill. I think that the, uh, he talked about one of the important amendments that he wrote, which would eliminate duplication. There are other reforms that allow private parties to buy out the federal government investment. There are many things we've done to update this program. But it is very important today. The one word I've come to use, perhaps overuse, is leverage. Leverage is crucial. We know that we're facing deficits and debts. We know we have to do something about spending. So we want to be wise. We want to see that when we do spend a dollar of federal money, that it really has a punch behind it. And this is one example, again, of that occurring. Seven dollars on average for every dollar invested in the case of Oklahoma in this one example, ten dollars. There are others where it's even higher than that. Um, you know, I think it is very clear. Uh, we see now, I'm not, I'm not sure this is the up-to-date list, but we have many, many, many uh, supporters of the EDA. So I'll, I'm going to show you some of them here. The U.S. Conference of Mayors, the American Public Works Association, the National Association of Counties. I mentioned this morning I started out in my first elected office as a county supervisor. They understand how important the EDA is because they're on the ground in these counties as the mayors are in the cities. And they see the needs and in these underserved areas, in these redevelopment areas, and they want to attract the private capital. So they really need the help that the EDA gives them to do it. Uh, the Association of University Research Parks, let me tell you why they like this. We have seen incubator projects, small business incubator projects that start out in these research parks that grow into mature job producing businesses. EDA is the spark, EDA is the leverage, the leverage that we need. 
So that's why you see the Association of University Centers, International Economic Development Council, National Association of Development Organizations, National Business Incubation Association. We know today it's tough for some businesses to get the, the capital. Some of them are fortunate. They go to Silicon Valley. They'll get some dollars there. Some will go to banks. They'll be told, you know what, it's too risky. The banks aren't lending like they frankly should uh, to create the jobs. So the leverage that is gotten for these programs from the federal government goes a very, very long way. State Science and Technology Institute, a University Economic Development Association, National Association of Regional Councils. So we see here, uh, we have a record of job creation, we have a lot of support, and in 2009, this really says it all, 160,000 jobs over a two-year period in 09. Now, this is a story that's a success story, and it's why Senator Inhofe and I joined together on this. I know that this is going to be a uh, contentious uh, time in the next few days on this bill because of some contentious amendments that have nothing to do with the underlying bill are going to be offered. All I would say to colleagues is, let's not allow this jobs bill to be weighted down so that we do nothing. The American people are sick of it. We had a small business bill. Mary Landrews stood right here, the chairman of the Small Business Committee, day after day, begging colleagues, don't offer poison pill amendments to, to that bill. You know who lost? Not Mary Landrew. The American people lost. The small businesses lost because this bill, the small business bill, became the way everybody offered everything they've ever dreamed about and thought about, and a lot of it was controversial. And so I just would urge colleagues on both sides of the aisle, if you're going to offer amendments that are not related, will you please agree to time agreements? Let's get rid of these uh, amendments one way or t'other. If they pass, fine. If they don't, that's life. But let's get to the reauthorization of the EDA. It started in 1965. It has saved jobs. It has created jobs. And any problems that we've had be because of some of the rules, we've addressed in this reauthorization. So uh, I have here a letter, a legislative alert, right hot off the press from the AFL-CIO. They support the passage of S-782 the Economic Development Revitalization Act of 2011. For five decades, they say, the EDA has played an often unheralded but important role in creating jobs, spurring economic growth in economically distressed areas. The public investments supported by this legislation make a little funding go a long way by leveraging private dollars in support of these projects. Resources for technical assistance and in research infrastructure assisting in the development and implementation of economic development strategies helps revitalize communities. EDA has established an admirable track record in assisting economically troubled low-income communities with limited job opportunities by putting their investments to good use in promoting needed job creation and industrial and commercial development. Today, they say, when the lack of jobs and income stagnation are the primary issues facing us, it's a bipartisan bill S-782 that can help make a difference. We urge Congress to pass the Economic Development Revitalization Act of 2011. I think that really says it. And um, I have one more letter I just got. Okay. We have a, a letter from the U.S. Chamber, uh, the Business Civic Leadership, saying how much they support the program. And they say, I'm writing to share with you the U.S. Chamber's uh, Business Civic Leadership Center's positive experience in working with the EDA. EDA has served as a valuable partner in many communities. They cite San Jose, California, Seattle, Washington, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Mobile, Alabama, New Orleans, Louisiana, Atlanta, Georgia, Boca Raton, Florida, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Newark, New Jersey, and others. And I know some of these programs that went into these cities 
with this relatively small investment by the federal government spurring all this uh, private sector capital and local and state funds. The EDA, they say they've worked with the EDA in conducting regional forums to bring corporate contribution professionals together with economic development experts. They provide opportunities to build up relationships between and among companies and government agencies. Um, they developed a report that maps how and why companies invest in communities across the U.S. And they believe that as they work with them on these programs, including working with local chambers of commerce in disaster affected regions to provide local recovery grants, that that worked very well. And they say they're the corporate citizenship arm of the U.S. Chamber. They work with thousands of business and local chambers on community development and disaster recovery. And they're consistently looking for best practices, lessons learned, technical assistance, planning and strategy support, and other insights, tools, and techniques to make their communities as economically competitive as possible. And they say, in our experience, EDA members have displayed a high degree of professionalism and technical expertise. They've engaged with us on multiple levels, from consultations at the national level to sharing valuable field experiences at the state and local levels. They say we've canvassed many businesses in local chambers about their community development needs, and they almost unanimously tell us that some of their highest priorities include business recruitment and retention and helping small and medium-sized businesses grow. They also tell us that support for regional economic development planning that transcends municipal boundaries is an increasing area of interest, and this is a unique ability that EDA can and does support. As you consider EDA's future role and responsibilities, we'd be happy to share with you our experience and lessons learning with working with the agency to provide you with additional uh, information. It's signed by Stephen Jordan, Executive Director, the Business, Business Civic Leadership Center of the Chamber of Commerce. So here we have an arm of the Chamber of Commerce sending us a letter of praise for the EDA, and we have the AFL-CIO uh, doing the same. So it's another one of these examples. Senator Inhofe referred to the highway bill. That's another example where we have both sides coming together. And what I want to say to colleagues who may be watching in their office or hearing this as they do their other work, please let's get this done. Every single person in this chamber goes home and talks about jobs, 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 and jobs, and jobs. So if we mean it, if we're not just posturing or posing for pictures, and we really mean it, then let's get it done. We had a bad experience here with the small business bill, got loaded up with things that had nothing to do with anything, and we didn't get time agreements, and we couldn't get it done. Let's hope that this gets done. I can't imagine anybody holding up this bill when we know that in 2009 it funded, a, an, over a two-year period, 160,000 jobs at a very small cost to uh, federal taxpayers, because that cost is leveraged. So uh, I could go on about EDA, and I will later. I think I've spoken enough at this particular time. And uh, Mr. President, unless there's someone on the floor, I would note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Majority Leader. We're in a quorum call, is that true? We are in a quorum call. I ask consent that be vitiated. Without objection, it's ordered. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the cloture motion with respect to the motion to proceed to S-782, the Economic Development Act, be withdrawn, and the Senate adopt the motion to proceed to S-782. Without objection, it's ordered. Thank you, Mr. President. Further, that after clerk reports the bill, the committee report amendment be agreed to, the bill as amended be considered as original text for the purpose of amendments, the motion reconsider be considered made and laid on the table with no intervening action or debate, and that Senator Tester be recognized to offer an amendment, followed by Senator Durbin to the recognized offer amendment. Following that, Senator uh, Boxer and Inhofe be allowed to give their opening statements on this legislation. Reserving the right to object, Senator Inhofe and I have already spoken on the floor. What I would appreciate is just uh, two minutes before we turn to Senator Tester just to set the stage. Well, and I, I, I think that I protected you in that regard. He, I want to get the amendment laid down and the second degree amendment laid down. All right. Okay? Okay. So I would renew my request. Is there objection? Without objection, sort of. The clerk will report. Calendar number 38, S 782, a bill to amend the Public Works and Economic Development Act of 1965 to reauthorize that act and for other purposes. Mr. President. Senator from Montana. Mr. President, I have an amendment at the desk that I'd like to call up. The clerk will report. The Senator from Montana, Mr. Tester proposes an amendment number 392. At the appropriate place, insert the following. Mr. President, I would ask that the reading of the minutes be suspended. With objection, Mr. Okay. Uh, Mr. President, appropriate that I could speak for a few minutes? Yep. Mr. President. The consent agreement was that he would offer his amendment, Durbin would offer his amendment, and Boxer would be recognized. Okay. That's what's the order. Senator from Illinois. I yield. Mr. President, I ask for the yeas and nays on the pending amendment. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. Mr. President. The yeas and nays are ordered. Mr. President, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. The Senator from Illinois, Mr. Durbin, proposes an amendment number 393 to amendment number 392. Mr. President, I ask consent the reading of the amendment be dispensed with. Without objection, it's ordered. Senator from Montana. Uh, I have, okay. Over the last month, Mr. President, uh, Senator Corker and I have worked with uh, several senators who are concerned about the unintended consequences of the debit interchange amendment that the Senate adopted last year. We voted against that amendment. We were concerned about the impact of those consequences on folks, especially across rural America, who rely on their small banks and credit unions. The Federal Reserve's rules based on this amendment are about to go into effect. And the result is going to be bad for the small banks and credit unions and ultimately for the whole country, but especially rural America. Even Chairman Bernanke admits the rule could result in some smaller banks being less profitable or even failing. I am proud to be joined in this effort by uh, Senators Crapo, Senator Bennett, Senator Hagan, and several others, all folks who share my concern about the impact of debit interchange fee on our local banks. Senator Corker and I began with the concern that local community banks and credit unions would end up being subject to the same one-size-fits-all regulation designed to address the excesses of some of the world's largest financial institutions. As I have said over and over and over again, those big Wall Street banks are going to be just fine. They have plenty of, re uh, plenty of sources for their revenue. No one needs to shed a tear for them. But the Main Street banks and the credit unions will not be okay if these rules are implemented. Let me give you one example. Community First Credit Union has two branches, one in Miles City and one in Ekalaka, Montana. Those two towns are about as far away from Wall Street as you can get. Ekalaka, in fact, is pretty far away from just about everywhere. 
But last year, the Senate approved an amendment that was aimed at holding the big banks accountable for the fees they charge when you swipe a debit card at Walmart. Folks were promised that we would have a split system where big banks like Bank of America would get one interchange rate and Community First Credit Union would be able to get a higher rate. The reality is going to be quite different. Without changes, the small guys like Community First will not see this promised benefit. This so-called two-tiered system will not work under the current law. And that's not my opinion. It's the opinion of the folks who regulate these small banks. What Ben Bernanke and Sheila Baer and others say is that market forces will inevitably push the rate down to the lowest level. That push has already started. Retailers are seeking laws at the state level to give themselves the freedom to deny purchases with debit cards that have a higher interchange fee. Given the amount of money the big box retailers are putting into their lobbying campaigns, it is only a matter of time before they're successful. So what happens to the consumer who does their banking at a small community bank or credit union? These are the folks I'm concerned in because they are the majority of Montanans. Unfortunately, they're going to get stuck with higher fees with no access to capital or even worse, no banks at all. And let's be clear, if any single one of the regulators whether it be the chairman of the Federal Reserve or the chair of the FDIC or the com comptroller of currency, had told me that the interchange system proposed last year would actually protect small banks and credit unions, we would not be here. But that is not what happened. The chairman of the Federal Reserve said that without changes, the system that will be implemented on July 21st will cause small institutions, the kind of banks that serve most Montanans, to suffer and some could even fail. The chair of the FDIC said that unquestionably these banks would be hurt. The credit union administrator agrees. Perhaps they will make up for those losses by raising rates on checking accounts. Maybe it will be higher fees when a small business comes in looking for a loan to expand or that will surely help the biggest banks to capture more of the market share at the expense of the smaller banks like Community First. This week, we have a chance to stop and rewrite these rules before they hurt those small banks, before they hurt those small credit unions, before the new rules hurt the, hurt the consumers and the small businesses in rural America that prefer to do their banking business with the folks who know them and who are a part of their communities. Rural America is what I know. It is where I am from. And as I have watched consolidation in the agricultural industry and have watched rural America get smaller and smaller, I'm not about to let this happen in the financial services industry. Fewer banking options in rural America is a death knell for rural America. And that is where we are headed today. One way to stop this from happening is first to slow down and fix the debit interchange regulations so that the small banks that serve rural America don't get hit. We, we also know how dangerous it is to set a price for a product without understanding all of the costs that go into that product. Small business owners certainly couldn't stay in business if they didn't understand their own costs. Likewise, if we're going to be regulating debit interchange fees, we need to understand all of the costs associated with the debit transaction and debit programs. When we voted on this amendment last year, we thought we were voting to allow the Federal Reserve to consider all costs. However, the reality is that last year's interchange amendment limited the costs that could be included. Some fraud costs were allowed to be included, but others were not. Some technology costs were included, but others not. The result is a proposed Fed rule that sets the debit interchange rate at 7 or 12 cents for all tra transactions, a level that most folks agree is too low. I'm sure that the big block retailers think that 7 cents or 12 cents is too high. In fact, they've argued for a rate should be closer to 4 cents. Now, I've heard from many of my retailers in my home state, and some of them have said that 12 cents is probably too low, and they can understand that you absolutely can't set the price of doing business below the business that it costs. If we're going to be regulating this market, we must do it in a way that's fair, in a way that still directs the Fed to determine what is reasonable and proportional, but to give them the discretion to look at all of the costs associated with debit transactions. That does not mean executive pay. That does not mean the cost of a corporate jet or a special rewards program. All the costs will still need to be justified. But the Fed will not be limited arbitrarily in what they can look at. 
That is why my friend Senator Corker and I are offering this amendment today. This amendment is a compromise, and that's how we do business in Montana. We find the common ground and we work together to do what's best. Senator Corker and I first proposed a two-year delay of the Fed's rules to allow adequate time to study the impact on small banks and rewrite the rules based on what we learned in that study. The Fed tells us now that it may be able to do this joint study in six months. So that is what our amendment proposes. Just six months to study whether the rules that will govern debit interchange marketplace can protect small banks. In this amendment, we outline the topics that the study should address, including taking a closer look at all of the actual costs associated with debit card transactions the impact on consumers, and whether an exemption for small banks, as proposed in the interchange amendment last year, will actually work. If, after the study, at least two of the agencies involved determine that the current rules don't take into account all costs, that the rules may harm customers, or that the exemption meant to protect small banks and credit unions won't work, then the Fed has six more months to rewrite the rules considering all costs. That's one year. Mr. President, to address our concerns and to make sure rural banks don't get wiped out by this rule. If the agency find that the rules consider all costs, consumers would not be harmed, and that the small issuer exemption will work, then the current rules pending would move forward. And what about the little guys? Well, we put into place a process that will address any potential impact on small issuers. My contention has long been that market forces would drive, fee drive fees for small issuers to the lowest rate. Since we cannot fully understand how the market will operate until interchange regulation is enacted, we direct the Fed to report the actual impact, port the actual impact of the market on small issuer a year after the rules are implemented. And the Fed has to present a report to Congress and every other year thereafter on the impact of a regulated market on small issuers. Most importantly, the report will include recommendations for how to resolve any potential harm to small issuers and to enforce the exemption. This will help make sure that when Congress acts, we will have the facts about how we would impact small banks. That means the regulatory process is over in 12 months and Congress does not have to revisit this issue. Let me say it again. Congress does not have to reissue, revisit this issue. And at the end of the entire process, there is still a regulated market for debit interchange fees. That's what the Senate voted for last year loudly and clearly. And we preserve the regulated marketplace, which is what Senator Durbin and others have been calling for. We will have regulated marketplace once we fully understand all of the costs relative to debit transactions and the impact of these rules on consumers and small issuers. That is what the majority of the Senate voted for last year, and that is what we will get but it will be a regulatory framework that does not penalize small banks and credit unions and is fair by not setting prices below cost. When every banking regulator who has a role in overseeing the debit interchange market tells you that Congress has created a system that will not work in a way that was intended, then we ought to listen. Today's debit interchange market is not fair for some retailers, so I understand their desire to see a fix. But the answer is not to create a new system that is unfair to the small banks in Montana and other parts of rural America. The amendment that the Senate approved last year was designed to punish Wall Street. But the result may be the bank in Ekalaka and the other banks all over rural America who will lose customers and potentially even fail. Let's measure twice and cut once. Let's do it quickly, but let's make sure we get this right and that if we're going to create regulations, we're doing it in a way that is fair and consistent with the intent. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment. With that, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Uh, Senator from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I rise to speak favorably towards the Tester Corker Amendment. I want to thank my colleague. I would I ask the Senator from Tennessee yes. if he would mind yielding and indicating how long he might be speaking? Eight minutes, max, eight to ten. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to say that uh, my friend from Montana has been a great partner in this effort. I know that lots of times uh, people use a lot of rhetoric down here to talk about what's happening and the fact that anyone who might be proposing this type of amendment might be uh, uh, supporting Wall Street institutions. But I think you can see that my friend of, from Montana 
uh, is anything but Wall Street, and uh, certainly uh, I think all of us are just trying to come up with a solution uh, that makes sense. And I just want to give just a brief history. Dodd-Frank came to the floor uh, last year. There were numbers of amendments uh, to, to the bill. One of the amendments that came to the floor was called the Durbin Amendment. It was an amendment uh, that had had no hearings. And uh, a lot of us, uh, people like myself that are opposed to price fixing, what the Durbin Amendment uh, said was that the Fed was going to set prices on debit uh, transactions. We're opposed to it. On the other hand, there were numbers of people in this, uh, in this chamber that supported Durbin because they were frustrated with uh, where retailers were and their inability to negotiate uh, prices with Visa and some of the other companies. And, and so they thought that this might be a type of solution to that dilemma of not being able to have appropriate negotiations. I think what all have understood, regardless of where they are on this issue now, is that the Durbin Amendment um, didn't actually give the Fed the ability to set prices as it relates to cost on debit cards. It only allowed certain costs. In other words, the incremental cost of a transaction. And I think the retailers that I know are very strongly supportive of the Durban language know, they all tell me this anyway in private, they know they couldn't operate themselves under that same scenario, but they're just frustrated. And so what uh, Tester and I and others, Mike Crapo, who voted for Durban, I might add, uh, Kay Hagan, who voted for Durban, Senator Bennett from Colorado, who voted for Durban, what people have realized is that the Durban Amendment is way too narrow and doesn't allow appropriate costs to be considered by the Fed when setting these rates. And so my friend from Montana, who has numbers of rural uh, uh, institutions, I have the same in my state, we all realize that this is going to be highly detrimental to the financial system. And so what we tried to do is come up with a compromise that works for both sides. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Senator Crapo, Senator Hagan, Senator Brown, Senator Carper, numbers of people have gotten involved in this and come up with a one-vote strategy. I know numbers of people want to vote and get this behind them. And I understand that this is one of those issues where you've got retailers on one side, you've got bankers on the other side, and you feel like in some way you're, you're trying to, to deal, you know, you're trying to pick between friends. What I think we're trying to do is just put a good, sound policy in place, a place that the retailers should be very happy because they're going to end up with a regulated market, something candidly that I don't support, but I think the senator from Illinois has been very successful in that front, and basically the retailers win on this because they're going to end up with something that's regulated. They feel like they don't have the ability to negotiate with Visa and other institutions, and so now the Fed is going to be set pricing. On the other hand, those senators, most senators in this body that understand economics, understand business, also know that you cannot run a business if you're only going to charge the incremental cost. It'd be like a, a pizza parlor setting, p selling pizza, literally, and only being able to charge for the dough that it, that it takes to make the pizza, not to be able to charge for electricity, not to be able to charge for the other things that it takes to actually run that particular place. So I think we've come up with something that is a good middle-of-the-road solution. Um, the Fed is directed to consider both fixed cost and incremental cost, something that any retailer or any business in America would want to be considered if they were being regulated. Um, and so we've come up with a play. We also have come up with a solution that allows the Fed to look back every two years and make sure that those smaller institutions that Senator Tester is so concerned about and I'm so concerned about that the Fed looks at those and ensures that every two years that these policies that are being put in place don't disproportionately negatively affect those institutions. If so, they recommend, they don't prescribe, they recommend to Congress possible legislative remedies. As the Senator mentioned, I think we should measure twice, cut once. I think this ends up putting this issue in the place that is fair. Uh, I'm feeling momentum building around this. I will say that uh, the senator from Illinois is an outstanding, outstanding legislator. I think he's done a very good job championing this issue. I don't think we'd be where we are on this issue without the efforts that he has put forth. But I think he realizes possibly that, you know, by not keeping in place all costs as it relates to the transaction, what you're really doing is limiting 
the availability of that to the public down the road. You limit innovation. You limit the amount of technology investment that goes towards these transactions. I hope very soon to be paying my bills by just swiping uh, you know, my electronic uh, device in front of a, a cash register. And I think we all see us moving towards this, but what, what the Durban Amendment in the form that it's in does now is basically say to these institutions, when you conduct these types of transactions, debit transactions, you're going to lose money every time you do it. And I don't think that's where we want to be. So, uh, again, uh, there are going to be some unintended consequences. Whenever there's a bill the size of Dodd-Frank that passes, surely all of us can come together and figure out more common sense ways of solving problems like this when they arise. I would have to say that I really like the way this body is functioning around this issue. We have people on both sides of the aisle that have realized that this policy is one that's detrimental. We have people on both sides of the aisle that have tried to work together. We've got three iterations now of Corker Tester to try to get it in a place that's in the middle of the road that takes into account the concern of retailers and takes into account the concern of small credit unions, small banks around this country they are going to be devastated, as all the regulators have said. This is unusual, by the way. We talk about regulatory overreach in this body. This is a case where we've given the regulators the ability to regulate, and they're saying, please don't make us do this. This is really bad policy. That rarely happens in Washington, but it's happened on this case. So out of, uh, out of respect for the tremendous amount of work that so many people have put into coming up with a slightly better solution than the senator from Illinois who worked so hard on this issue put forth originally, I would just ask every member to please, whether you end up voting with us or not, and I hope you will, please sit down for 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, and allow your staff to at least explain. I know a lot of people have made commitments 10 days ago, a week ago, uh, to be on the other side of this, but I think most people haven't seen the last iteration that puts this in the middle of the road, that keeps debit cards regulated, but gives the regulators the ability to at least consider the cost that any normal business has when it functions. So with that, uh, Mr. President, I thank you for the time to talk about it. I thank uh, the senator from Illinois who looks like he's getting ready to speak. I thank him for the way that he's conducted himself. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think we've come up with such a great solution. I would hope that uh, the senator from Illinois would consider being a co-sponsor. And with that, I yield the floor. <laughs> Mr. President. The senator from Illinois. To my friend from Tennessee, not a chance. Uh, so my wife over the weekend in Springfield said, I'd like you to clean the garage. And I said, well, I've decided to clean half the garage. It's a compromise. She said, who did you compromise with? That's what we're faced here. Senators Corker and Tester come to the floor and say, we have a compromise. Who did you compromise with? It wasn't with the people who were affected by these debit card fees, no. They compromised among the banks. The banks all sat down and said, let's, let's work this out among us, because we're talking about real money here. And that's their compromise. It's not a compromise. What is this all about? The average person listening to this debate has got to think, what are they fighting over there in the United States Senate, this bipartisan battle? What we're talking about here is something we all kind of carry around in our wallets and purses these days, a debit card. And if I take this card and go to a local restaurant, well, let's use a different one. If I went to a local convenience store and said, I want to get a pack of chewing gum, Wrigley's, because that's based in Chicago. I want to get a pack of Wrigley's chewing gum. Here's my debit card. And they take the debit card these days, and they swipe it, and they complete the transaction. What you don't know, but the merchant knows, is he just lost money on that, because it costs more to the merchant selling the good to process the piece of plastic, then they could poss possibly profit on the goods that they're selling. And so you wonder, how did it reach this point where the use of this piece of plastic costs so much? It reached that point because the big giants of credit cards, Visa and MasterCard, said to merchants and retailers all across America, 
If you want to accept plastic at your place of business, then you're going to pay us a swipe fee every time that piece of plastic goes through the reader. And how much is that swipe fee? Turns out it's 1.10 percent on average. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. The banks that issue these cards receive each month in swipe fees from all across the United States from convenience stores, restaurants, hotels, charities. If you gave your donation to Red Cross because of the terrible thing that happened in Joplin, Missouri and used your debit card, guess what? Visa and MasterCard got a percentage of it, the amount that you thought you were giving to the charity. College bookstores, you name it. Every time you swipe these, it ends up generating each month on average for the banks across America $1.3 billion. Each year, more than $15 billion in swipe fees. And what did the merchants have to say about how much they were being charged? Nothing. Take it or leave it, buddy. You don't want to pay the swipe fee? Don't take plastic. So, over the years, as you might expect, the merchants and retailers said, this is a rotten deal. Not only is this an invisible charge that we have to add to the cost of doing business on everything, we have no control over it. We're faced with paying the swipe fee or not accepting plastic, and in this day and age, imagine how long you'd last in many businesses if you didn't accept debit cards. So four or five years ago, I called for a study what is a reasonable amount to charge? And I was opposed, naturally, by the banking industry. They put out an all-points bulletin, kill the Durban study of debit fees. They didn't want to study it. All the study can do is put the spotlight on them. They don't want that to happen. So we waited and we waited, and last year we had the Wall Street financial reform bill. And I sat here patiently on the floor saying, I want to offer this amendment to finally come up with a reasonable way to regulate this fee, which is not a product of competition and isn't transparent or disclosed. Well, the vote finally came along. And after 25 amendments on Wall Street reform, they decided this vote wouldn't require a majority. It would require 60 votes, supermajority. Okay, I'm ready to live with it. We called it, we won 64 votes in favor of our position. Well, it surprised a lot of people. It sure as heck surprised the banks. They didn't think that this Senate, on a bipartisan basis, would hold them accountable for the fees they're charging on the debit card. So what did we say in the law? The Federal Reserve, a nonpartisan bank regulating agency, would have the authority to determine what is a reasonable and proportional fee for swiping the card. And that fee would go into effect this July, July 21st, a year, one year after we passed the law. And we said in the meantime, anyone who has any thoughts, ideas, or comments, send them to the Federal Reserve. They got 11,000 plus comments. Everybody had an idea. Some of them didn't like the law, some did, on and on. And so they came out with a preliminary report, not a rule, preliminary report in December. You know what they found? They found that the average charge per transaction in the United States was 44 cents, and the average cost to the bank for processing the debit transaction, about 12 cents, about one-fourth. So the plot thickens. It turns out that the banks issuing these cards are not only charging this invisible fee, they're dramatically overcharging. Merchants and retailers, and guess what, Mr. and Mrs. Consumer, all of us too. We pay it. We pay it in additional charges. Even if you go into that store to buy the package of chewing gum with cash, the price has been raised because they are expecting you to give plastic instead, and you pay more. So then the battle was on. Whether or not the Federal Reserve would issue this rule establishing a more reasonable fee, swipe fee, for these debit cards. And it is a big battle. Imagine, if you will, what it means 
to the biggest banks in America when they have on the line $1.3 billion a month. Pulled out all the stops. A friend of mine who's a lobbyist downtown in Washington said, Durbin, praise the Lord, come up with some more ideas. This is a full employment amendment. Everybody who's a lobbyist in Washington is working on this amendment. We just love you to pieces. Well, the sad reality is it's coming, maybe, to a close with the vote on this amendment. But the banks and the credit card companies started piling it on. And let me be fair, the other side did too. The merchants and retailers finally said, for goodness sakes, we want fair treatment, and if we have to fight to protect this new law, we're going to fight to do it. And that's where we are today. Senator Tester of Montana, Senator Corker of Tennessee have offered an amendment, which I'm about to describe. This is interesting, though. They are offering this amendment in an effort to stop the Federal Reserve from issuing a rule that will establish how much that swipe fee is going to be. Well, how soon would the Fed issue the rule? Within the month, within a matter of days. They are desperate to get this amendment to the floor to try to stop the Federal Reserve from saying what is a fair swipe fee and to protect merchants, retailers, small businesses, and consumers across America. The banks want to stop them. So there's one other part of this story that's important. We decided when we wrote this law that we would give smaller banks, community banks, and smaller credit unions an exemption. In other words, they're not covered by the Federal rule. And you say, why? From a consumer's point of view, all the arguments you made still apply. Well, that's true, but many of these smaller institutions are more financially vulnerable. And I happen to agree with both Senators Tester and Corker. I believe in community banks and local banks, and I want them to survive. So we carved them out and said, if the value of your bank is below $10 billion, you're not going to be affected by this. If the value of your credit union is below $10 billion, you won't be affected by this. How many did we exempt? Out of 7,000 banks in America, only 100 would be affected by the law. And out of 7,000 credit unions, only three would be affected by the law. But then there's another part of the story. It turns out that the three biggest banks in America are the ones that make the most money on debit fees. Each month they collect more than 50% of the debit fees. What are those banks? Chase, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America. They have been fighting viciously to stop this rule from going to effect because there are billions of dollars at stake. And they don't want that, they don't want to lose that income. So let's have a little trip down memory lane about these banks. Do you remember a few years ago when these banks got us in the biggest economic mess in current memory? Did you notice any change in your savings account? Perhaps your IRA? The money you put away for your retirement? Well, I sure did. I think Loretta and I lost about 30% of our value. Because they were playing games with subprime mortgages and new derivatives and AIG offices in London, and this holy mess ended up being visited on families, businesses, and consumers all across America. And we were in a panic. The chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, and the chairman or the secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, came and met with us in a room not far from here and said, if you don't do something and do it immediately, banks across America are going to fail and our our economy is going to collapse, not just here, but across the world. You've got to come to their rescue. You've got to come up with a bailout for the banks. Remember that, taxpayers of America? Well, how did the big three debit card banks do in the bailout? Chase, $25 billion in taxpayers' money because they had acted so recklessly and endangered their bank that they needed a helping hand. Bank of America, $45 billion in taxpayer bailout funds. Wells Fargo, $25 billion in taxpayer bailout funds. Remember that, taxpayers of America? When the same banks that are going to profit from these debit card fees were so desperate that they needed a helping hand from taxpayers to save their banks? And do you remember how they expressed their gratitude to us? It was heartwarming. As soon as they could, they called a meeting of the board of directors and awarded one another 
bonuses, bonuses for their reckless conduct. It just warmed my heart that they were so appreciative of the taxpayers across America sacrificing with their taxes to save these big old banks. Well, I've got news for taxpayers. They're back. They're back today. And now it's smaller, I'll concede. It's only $15 billion a year, but these same big banks are asking for a handout and a subsidy from the Senate. Are we going to get shaken down a second time? That's what this debate is all about. Because I'll tell you, at the end of the day, if this amendment that's pending on the floor passes, then for at least a year, and I think way beyond it, these banks will continue to bring in $1.3 billion out of the wallets and purses of consumers across America every time a person uses one of these plastic cards. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right. I think there is a way to deal with this and deal with it honestly, and let me tell you what it is. Let the Federal Reserve issue its rule this month. They're going to come out with it, and let's look at it. Nobody knows what it's going to say. I've heard both senators who introduced this amendment say, well, this rule, we can't accept this rule. They don't know what this rule is, and neither do I. It hasn't been issued yet or published. At a minimum, shouldn't we wait to see it before we say it's unacceptable? I'm ready to wait. I trust the Federal Reserve will do its job. I think it can produce a good rule, a rule that's fair to consumers, retailers, small businesses, and to banks, too. Let me go to Senator Carker's point. Senator Carker said, you know the problem with Durbin's amendment? He just doesn't allow the banks to add in all the possible charges and costs in a debit card transaction. He's just allowing them to count the value of the dough and the pizza and not all the other things that they might add in. No, what we said was you can charge a fee reasonable and proportional to the cost of the transaction. Pretty simple, right? Reasonable and proportional. Well, this amendment on the floor here decided to open the door wide open. It's no longer reasonable and proportional. They have full pages here describing all the different things the banks can add in to establish the fee they charge small businesses and consumers. Are you trusting of these banks to be careful in what they add in? I'm not. And I can tell you that when you look at the list of things that they can include, it includes executive compensation because it's about the cost of the operation of the program. That happens to include a lot of managers and officers as well. And I don't know what else it includes. It is wide open. So here's what the banks have said. Incidentally, I guess it is somewhat gratifying when your name gets associated with amendment and you hear it over and over and over again. Chase, for example, wrote to every uh, person who was a customer in my home state of Illinois and said, beware of the Durban Amendment. If the Durban Amendment goes through and reduces the debit fee charge that we can charge, your fees are going up. Your benefits and premiums are going down. Here's what Chase failed to mention, and the other banks as well. The total amount the big three banks take in a year from debit card fees is about a little over almost half of the total amount collected. So it's about $8 billion a year. And so the argument that J.B. Diamond and Chase are making is if you cut our debit card fees, well, I'm sorry, your fees are going to have to go up. You know, it's just one of those things. It's the cost of doing business. What Mr. Diamond and others in the business failed to note is that last year, on Wall Street, the banks awarded in bonuses, bonuses, $20.8 billion. So when they argue that an $8 billion loss means fees are going up, oh, really? Or does it mean bonuses might go down on behalf of consumers and businesses all across America? That's part of it. Now, let me tell you a few things about the pending amendment you should know. As I mentioned, it's not a compromise. Second, it includes costs that cover the whole ballpark, that they can start saying, well, we're going to add in the cost of ATM machines to the debit card fees pretty soon. Get serious. They're right back up to 44 cents a transaction. That's how it's designed. Third, they very carefully wrote this so there's no effective date for the rule. 
Oh, they talk about 12 months? What it says in here, the board will decide what the effective date will be. There's no effective date for this going into effect, and that is awful. And finally, the arguments that are made on the floor over and over and over again is we just want to protect the community banks and credit unions. That's why we're doing all this. Not a word in here, one reference, take that back, one reference and one trigger to these smaller exempt institutions. There were ways, and they know it, if they wanted to, to have even more protection and reassurance for the smaller community banks and credit unions. They didn't include them, because that isn't what this is about. This is about all of the banks, and particularly the big, giant banks on Wall Street that have at stake in this amendment $8 billion a year in profits, $8 billion a year in subsidies through this amendment and through the second round of bailouts. It's a good test. It's a good test for the Senate. I don't know how it's going to end. I won last year, but they've poured it on ever since. And the banks have done everything they can to reverse what we accomplished last year. It's up to my colleagues now. They have to decide whose side they're going to be on. It's pretty simple. They're either going to be on the side of the banks and the credit card companies or on the side of consumers and businesses across America to give them a fighting chance. How many speeches have we heard on the floor of the Senate about small business? Boy, if we could just give small business, unleash the power of their expansion and hiring more people, we could turn this economy back where it should be. Well, this will be a direct hit on small businesses all across America if this pending amendment is enacted. This is our chance to say to the big banks on Wall Street, if you can have $20.8 billion in bonuses last year, you're doing quite well, thank you. Incidentally, one of these banks had a 48% increase in profits. They're doing okay, folks. We don't need a tag day for any of the Wall Street banks. And secondly, if you do believe in businesses, particularly small businesses and merchants and retailers in your hometown, for goodness sake, stand up for them. Fight for them. That's what they're asking for. That's what this debate is all about. Let's wait till this rule comes out. Let's defeat this amendment. Let's see what the Federal Reserve says. And I have given my word, I'll say it again. I will work with any senator on either side of the aisle. If we need to have any kind of reassurance or protection added to what we have done in this law, I'm there. As I've said many times, the only perfect law that I'm aware of is carried down a mountain on stone tablets by Senator Moses. The rest of the time, we just do our best. And if there's a way to improve it, I'll be there. But let us, at the end of the day, finally, finally, finally stand up for consumers and small businesses across America and say to the Wall Street banks and Visa and MasterCard, sorry, this party's over. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Mr. President. Uh, yes.